This is edition one of the Blacksmithing Technique Sessions, The Miner's Candlestick with Mark Asprey, module number four, the very last module. The Blacksmithing Technique Sessions are an audio visual interview with the blacksmith talking through their method of making a featured forged metal piece while viewing step-by-step -step photos of their techniques. The following sequence is an audio visual interview with Mark Asprey and Victoria Patty talking through Mark's personal method of making the miner's candlestick. This is the final and last module, module four, finishing the candle holder, dressing the corners and bending the eye. A special thank you to Mark Asprey and his devotion in cultivating the craft of blacksmithing through his many endeavors. Photo credits go to Mark Asprey, he took them all. And thank you to the first edition sponsor, the Artist Blacksmiths Association of North America, the nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the craft of blacksmithing. Now we're going to get into actually bending that stock that we just peened out. Right. The first thing here, can you see where I'd normally place my thumb on this to open, to mm -hmm. operate the candle? Exactly. Um, so you can see that is sitting on top of uh, corner number three or thereabouts. Oh, uh, yes. So that's important to know because we're going to make some uh, decisions in a little while. And this thumber has to be kind of springy. It does. Uh, and I do these out of mild steel and it, it's just fine. Uh, at one sixteenth of an inch. If you go heavier than that, it really becomes a, a bear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is uh, you have to know the diameter of your candle because we're going to make... Um, that circular bend there, so, and we need to know a length for the circumference. Uh, so typically mine are three-quarter inch candles, uh, and I think I get those from Dollar General. Can you say that? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, and that's uh, that's actually uh, hard to find because most of the ones you look at are seven-eighths of an inch, and I think they're just a little too visually big for the piece. So I'm definitely looking for the three-quarter or five-eighth even. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, again, you know, this is not luxury time. These are miners going down a hole. And then you'll notice my candle stops at the bottom of the candle holder. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you see photographs of miners using these in a mine, they actually have quite a bit of candle protruding That's beneath. That's right, it comes down here. That's right, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So they don't want the candle being too high, too top heavy, I suspect. I'm surprised they didn't have, um, like, drip pans. A drip cup? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because then they're just dripping all over their hats. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, you know, I've never thought of dripping over the hats. Yes, um, I don't know. Have you seen any with drip cups? No, I haven't. Hmm. No. Uh, and the, again, they're, they're, I've never seen drip cups. I've seen um, alternative arrangements for the hook where they have two feet to keep everything vertical when it's hanging on a wall or something like that or on a beam. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, there are many variations of this, so choose your flavor and go for it, really. Right. Golly. I wish I was back in the 1800s. I'd make a patent on a little drip right. cup. Right. <laughs> and there's lots of patents of these things. <laughs> All right. Next. Next. Oh, here we are. Trimming that bottom piece off. Okay. So the first C, it's, I'm in the vise. And you actually, a Beverly shear is perfect for this. But if you don't own a Beverly shear, then you take, uh, I use my hot cut right there. Mm. Uh, I have the jaws of the vise. I make a pencil mark first, and then I just cut this off. And this is done cold. Um, and I do it cold. You certainly can do it hot. Um, but I like to lay it out to make sure I am truly cutting on something that's parallel to the main parent bar, if you will. Sure. Uh, so I allow it to cool down, which is not going to take too long because it's 16th of an inch thick. Uh, I draw a pencil mark and then I cut it. And then you'll see I'm cutting a slice away. Where the chisel is now, uh, the material between the chisel and the bottom of the slide and would be ongoing. That's the circumference of the candle. And the material that is to the left and going away from the bottom of the slide towards the top is the thumber. Bottom slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the material. That's the circumference for the candle. And, this and then is... stuff, that's the thumb. Right, okay. Don't forget, you need to add to the circumference of the candle uh, the neutral axis of the material. So if you're dealing with a uh, three-quarter inch uh, candle, then we're actually dealing with a, what would that be, 13-16 circumference. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
And does it matter how long the thumber is? Did you uh, talk about that? It has to be usable, of course, uh, and not to a point where it's uh, a pain. But no, I don't think it does. Um, again, I'm making a piece to sit on the table, so I don't want it too terribly long. I don't want it short. I don't want it looking uh, pathetic. Um, so there's a visual correctness, and I suspect there will be a physical correctness to actually get an operating piece. And I'm, I typically, I think, I go for an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Um, that's to above the chisel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any tips on uh, cold chiseling starting it out? No, just don't. Uh, you notice I'm holding my chisel at an angle to the cutting surface. Um, yeah, so which... That's right. And that's my only caveat is uh, don't just charge it straight on because you're just going to pull it out. Right. Pull the material out of the vise. You have to start at an angle and keep working at the angle. Okay. Okay. And the sharper the jaws you buy, the better time you're going to have of it. And any advice on when it gets to the end? Is is that? No, does, it'll just go. It'll just off. come right yeah. off. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then you can run a rasp on it if you want to, mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay. Next slide. Here we go with the cutout. All right, so you notice I've cut the corners off the thumber, off the end of the thumber, just to save me file work. Again, you know, it comes down to that minute mm. of the forge thing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also rounded the corner, my peen corner, at the other end of the flag, just slightly. Over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the bottom, um, bottom corner, let me see, bottom slide and the bottom corner there, that's it. Right there, I, mm -hmm. I radius that just slightly mm -hmm. with the, the rasp, I think. Okay. And this is done cold as well? That's all done cold, okay. yes. Because it's cold at this stage, you've just cut it, so mm -hmm. no problem. Mm -hmm. And this, this sequence is important to get the order correct. I could roll the eye, and that would certainly, I understand why you would, but if you did, it would interfere with the edge of the anvil. If you look at that bottom slide, I couldn't have done that 90 degree turn with a rolled eye. So if that was rolled, if I turned that, I wouldn't be able to hold that material in that position, would exactly. I? The eye would be interfering. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this, we're working on corner number three. Correct. And folding it, making it into a 90. All close enough. Yeah, don't worry about the details. All right. Okay. So this is still corner number Three. three. Now I can bend the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, because if I make corner number two, then I can't get in there to manipulate the stock for the eye. So again, the order is important. Bend corner number three, then start to turn the eye. And I'm turning the root of the candle hover over with my pin there. Can that be done in one heat? Probably. Huh? Yeah. Um, mm. Yes, it can. Okay. But your thin material, if it's not at a heat, then take the heat because it, it's going to be easy to crack this. You're showing that you're, the peen of the hammer is hitting around this area of the candle holder. That's right. And I'm trying to make a bend there. To kind of bring it back around this way, right. correct? Okay. And then inertia on the other end of that candle holder, the bit that you can't see on the uh -huh. bottom left, uh -huh. inertia will hold that in place. So that whole piece is going to start to curve. Now, the first top left slide is showing first you go back to the top of your anvil. Right, and bend the thumber out of the uh -huh. way. Just a nice little sweet spot. We're bending away from that shoulder. Then so you my... come over and you're using another swage. Right, and I'm using a 7 8 bottom swage um, because I've got a 3 quarter candle, I've got 16th of thick material, so by the time I wrap everything, it should be 7 8 diameter. So I'm using a 7 8 bottom swage, and hopefully I've relieved the corners a lot. This is the beauty of making your own bottom swages. Um, is that I can make one with sharp corners, I can make one with you know relaxed corners, however I want it to be made. Uh, you know, and I have a number of blanks sitting ready to be manipulated at any one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not like I'm relying on the tailgate sails to make one and then I'm scared to change it. Right. I can make it and do whatever I need. Right, right. Okay. Now is this um, done hot or cold? Yes. No, do that hot. It is. Okay. 
Yeah, because we've already, we just forged the corner, so it's all going to be hot anyway. So let's just keep it hot. And you can see I'm uh, – so if we go one, two, three would be middle left. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm forging in the middle. At some point, um, the thumber is going to interfere with the hammer, and I'm obliged then to work on the outside of the bar, mm -hmm. which is going to be – slide four. Notice now I put a mandrel in, a piece of three-quarter inch bar to represent mm -hmm. the candle. And then I'm going to close that as best I can. And that bottom left slide, um, think of me moving the stock so I'm rotating the candle holder in the bottom swage as I sort of try and smooth out the whole mm -hmm. bend. So it's mm -hmm. not just held flat, I'm rotating it. And if I'm finding there's a bit that I can't get to, and typically there is, then I'll move to the offside edge of the anvil and just sweeten that up a little bit. And that's that slide number six, yeah. Again, with the mandrel in place. Oh, so and you'll see how the thumber now fits over the top of the corner number three because mm -hmm. we cut out enough material. Now, how many heats are you doing here? Boy, I'd really be afraid of burning this up too. <laughs> yes, you would be. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I typically get that done in uh, one heat. Uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed if I took two. Uh, if you take in more than two, yes, you run the risk of um, a lot of scaling and putting holes into this thing with scale. Um, so it's worked definitively. Um, so you, you've got to have a plan. As it was yeah. <laughs> when I was a, a young lad, the uh, the blacksmith who was teaching me came over to me one day and he says, I'm going to tell you something now that's really going to improve your speed as a blacksmith. And I thought, this is it. I've only been here three weeks and he's recognizing my full potential already. And he said, think about what you're going to do before you pull the material out of the fire. Okay, fair point. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so have a plan. Know what you want to do, then pull the material out, then go to work. Don't okay. be thinking about it as you've got the piece waving over the right, angle. Right, right. And it's okay to, you know, by this point, it can be a dull red. I mean, it still doesn't oh, have to be yeah. full yeah. on it's the major When you're trying to move it uh, major leagues, that's when you want the heat so you don't crack it. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so thin that it's still going to move okay. Absolutely. Okay. It might not flow nicely. You might end up with corner bits, you know, little sharp corners sure. where you like a nice radius. Um, but so you're going to have to, you know, work that out. But again, it's um, as the flags arise, you have to deal with them. So when you see a problem, you have to deal with it. I think that's the difference between a, a novice and a, an experienced smith. Mm -hmm. You know, the experienced smith may recognize the mistakes just seconds before the other guy does. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you do get to this point after one heat, but it's time to do another heat, and you do have a little bit of a square right. space, you know, yeah. airspace there. You take the mandrel out, put it, put it back in the fire, put the mandrel back in. Yes. And work it. Always mandrel in, okay. yes. Okay. Great. Let's move on to the next slide. What are we doing here? Well, now we're working on corner number two. And we're going to bend that, and I think I'm going to give you a number of something, 135 degrees or so. Uh, again, you know, have have an idea. The angle looks about right. I don't know if the numbers match the angle, but the angle looks about right to me. And it's that if ever you bend an eye in the middle of a bar, that's what you're looking at, and that looks about right for me. And you notice I'm working with uh, the corner over the bick, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm getting a nice inside radius as I'm using the hammer mm -hmm. to sharpen that outside corner that's mm. that peak of material that's just going to make a nice corner and it happens really quickly it's literally two or three blows once you make the bend it's two or three blows to clean it up and you've got a really nice sharp corner now when you're bending this to 135 degrees or visually yeah. right yeah. um are, d does this get in the way does it thumber no it doesn't no it doesn't okay uh, but again, that's that balance of making sure that the thumber is not too long and you've bent it enough so it doesn't get in the way. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top slide, you can see that it's um, definitely below that piece of bar, so mm -hmm. it shouldn't get in the way. Okay. Now on this slide, we're back on the BIC, and you're showing, is that the hook? That's the hook. So we want, actually want to do corner number one, um, but... We have to straighten the hook at some stage. You can do it before or after. I find it convenient to do it before, although if you look at the bottom slide, you can still see it's bent on that particular piece. 
Now, all of these are individual pieces. I don't make one and then stop at a stage and photograph. I've got you know, 30, 40 pieces of these things. Oh, so really? I, oh, yeah. I was wondering how you did that. <laughs> wow. And do you clean each piece? Because they look pretty clean. I do. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I brush it as they're cooling down and then I may take it to the wire wheel or I use a bit of vinegar. Um, mm -hmm. But again, that's the advantage of using the Coke forge is I don't get the same scaling right. that you would get in the gas forge. Okay, so you're saying that here's the hook with the bend. Right, and that, I would normally have it straight at this stage, but it's that one I didn't. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Okay. Uh, and I'm working up corner number one. Again, you can see that generous radius on the inside. Mm -hmm. the, the bend, a uh, quick wipe with the hammer to sharpen up the corner, and you're moving on. You can, um, the top slide actually, I've not only straightened the hook, I'm actually starting to put the, the hook into the, the piece. And you're bending corner number one. Okay, next slide. Now this is where the corners, this is how, it, this has got to be very tricky to line them up. Yes, it is. Now I'm being a little cavalier here bending over the bick. If I were just starting this and I was a little worried, I would probably do that over a piece of pipe held in the vise. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a six inches, which is probably a little more with our chamfering. So we've got a circumference of six inches or so, let's call it six and a half. Mm -hmm. So if we divide that by three, so if I got a piece of pipe with a two inch OD, that should pull around just nicely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I kind of noticed, you know, this is not a full round. It's no, kind it's of not. an oval, and that's only because you use the bic, the and uh, right? no, those corners are stopping that from uh, becoming a full round. And I want that teardrop shape. I like that teardrop shape. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a lot of physics going on here. So we've chamfered some portions. We left the bit that's uh, on the end that people are going to use to, let's say, hammer into the um, use the hammer on the the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and so. All of these have different resists because they're all different size material. So it's going to bend most conveniently where we've done the chamfering. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, so we're going to end up with a sort of somewhat flat-ended teardrop shape. Mm. And I like that. If you didn't like that, then, you know, you have to use um, the bending forks, as I'm showing in the bottom slide there, um, to just manipulate it. But I bend it. I try and get the corners as close as I can mm -hmm. to a lining. And then I come in with my... Um, bending forks, my well radius bending forks, because I don't want to put any dings into this thing now, mm -hmm. uh, and I start to true that up as best I can. Okay, so you're not hammering anywhere on here to, to get that corner closer to that now, corner. if I've got to do some hammering, I'll turn it around and I'll put the eye over the bick. But typically, uh -huh. with that middle slide, I'd be hammering on that little bit of material. In fact, I think you can see the hammer there. It's just that material between corner oh. one and the hook uh-huh right exactly there. and i'm trying to close just that just to tighten this up yeah and if it's way off then i'm going to use the forks i'm going to try not to forge it because i don't want to thin anything overly uh, and th this is a good application of the scrolling wrenches right or dog wrenches call them what you will dog wrenches yeah oh i haven't heard of that uh it, i think it actually there's there is a i think it's a verb here uh, dogging you can dog something and I think it comes from, uh, I know it from the railroad industry, you dog the wheels. Uh, but it probably comes from before that, you know, huh. horse and cart type thing. Mm -hmm. So a dog wrench. All right. So any, this is, what else can we talk about this one? Because this is the, I think this is kind of the, the trickiest part of all, I, I would it think. It is. Uh, and it's the most fun bit because you've got a lot of forging into it. And now... Mm -hmm. You just, I mean, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's a big light. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the celebration. Mm. Uh, and yes, it's going to be a little fussy. Um, so uh, I clamp, uh, I think I have the spike in the vise. Uh, that's the only bit you can hold on to. Everything else is proud of the material. So you put the spike in the vise, you've got the heat on the eye. Now, if you're in a gas forge, um, you may be getting a little frustrated at this stage because you've got way more heat mm. or length of heat than you need. Uh, again, I don't have that gas forge problem. So maybe you reach for oxycetylene rosebud or something like that. Mm. Um, and I don't know that. Uh, maybe the gas forge and length of heat is not a problem. I just, as I look at this now, I would anticipate a problem. But again, I'm not a big gas forge user. You want the heat no further. Right, exactly. 
do you want it to end here and go come all the way around and end here or do you even want it back here no i would i would heat the whole eye and i don't mind it going a little bit into those straighter sections remember the oh. corner is going to act as a resist it has more material than anything else so it's going to act to anchor the material you're not going to change that bend terribly much because everything else is going to change because it's thinner mm -hmm. if it's all heated equally now if you've got no heat in the eye and the corner is the only bit that's hot then yes the corner will move but if everything's hot it's going to bend where it's most convenient and that's where the stock is thinnest and that's going to be where you put those chamfers on mm -hmm. either side uh, of the eye in this bottom slide you're showing two yes whenever matches. you work with a dog wrench you should be working in pairs uh, one to stabilize the bit that you don't want to bend so the bend is occurring between those two pieces oh right here yes and Whereas not beyond you, that right if you only worked with one then you you're doing you're moving the whole material mm -hmm. as opposed to isolating the material and now hopefully you have a finished piece that looks like that's this. right so now you <laughs> wax it uh, put your candle in and it's ready for the market uh, at some stage, you want to put your maker's mark on there or something. Mm. Uh, so I, as a, a business, uh, I put a lot of effort into establishing the name of Mark Asprey. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't call myself a fancy, fictitious name. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my stamp says Mark Asprey or M. Asprey. You know, my business is Mark Asprey. Um, and so that works for me if you have a pseudonym then obviously you know or there's maker's mark maybe there's room at the base of the hook because that's your largest piece there you know, to carry a logo or something like that or actually in the candle holder too yeah yeah indeed um now again that could be a separate piece that candle holder and it could be brazed or silver soldered uh, both of those are appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so now is an opportunity for you to, yes, put in. And so, in fact, some of the earlier mines uh, would have their mine names, etc., on that. Mm. Um, so it's a nice advertising place. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very available. If you want to buy any of Mark's books, this is where you would go, correct, Mark? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Mark has three books. What are they called? It's the Skills of a Blacksmith is the series title, and then you've got the um, Mastering the Fundamentals of Blacksmithing, which is an entry-level book, and then Mastering the Fundamentals of Leafwork, which is now starting to get a little more specific, and then the last one that just came out is Looking at the Fundamentals of Joinery, Mastering the Fundamentals of Traditional Joinery. And if you go to his website, he does have descriptions and pictures of the books and little buy buttons as well. Yes, you can buy via PayPal, which is very convenient. Perfect. Very good. Thank you so much, Mark. I enjoyed it. It's nice to be able to put a little personality behind the decision making, why it is you do it the way you do it. I enjoyed that. I did too. I did too. Thank you so much. Blacksmith Her Radio. Forging blacksmiths together.